game show in all of Oshawa. As God made the world in six days, we have six questions in our first round to be answered for points and prizes. Let's meet our contestants. First up, weighing in at 130 Hebrew Mina. He's colorblind in both eyes. It's Simon. Did you know, Ryan, that a word which changes meaning when capitalized is called a capitonym? No, I, I did not. Next, from York Minister Citadel, we have William. Hello, I am William. Okay, and last but not least, from right here in Oshawa, Josh. Hi, I'm super excited to be here. All right, let's get started. First question, for 400 points, all the firstborn boys in Israel were in danger, including Moses. What did Moses' mother do to protect her son? I know! She placed Moses in a basket and sent him down the river where he was found by an Egyptian princess. Correct! Paige, tell him what he's won. William has won an authentic, one-of-a-kind, woven wicker basket, perfect for carrying fruit and babies. Amazing! Question 2 for 200 points. Moses grew up as a prince in Egypt but eventually had to flee the land. What caused Moses to run away? Oh, um, Moses got tired of seeing the Egyptians treat the Israelite slaves very poorly. So one day, Moses stood up for them and confronted an Egyptian. But they got into a fight and Moses ran away because he feared what the Pharaoh would do to him. Correct. Running from Egyptians can be difficult but can be made easier with a pair of brand new Nike running shoes. Congratulations, Simon. All right, question three for 300 points. One day when Moses was older, he was tending to a flock of sheep when he came across a bush that was on fire. What was the significance of this burning bush? Early signs of wildfires. Nope, nope, not even close. Anyone else? Uh, the bush was to get Moses' attention for the Lord to tell Moses that he was to go back to the Pharaoh to order him to let the slaves go. God chose Moses to be the one to free the Israelites. Correct. Burning bushes are great in the Bible, but not in the garden. William has won a beautiful hanging flower pot, a great addition to any spring garden. Question four, for 400 points. Moses was scared to go back to Egypt and face the Pharaoh on his own, but God said he would be with Moses. How did God prove this? God turned Moses' staff into a snake and then back into a wooden staff again. Correct, Josh. Moses had a staff led by God, but you've won not just a stick, 
but a mighty staff of your own, great for walking through any promised land. Uh-oh. You know what that means? No, actually we don't. It's the 10 plagues for 500 points. When Moses went back to Egypt, he told Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, but the Pharaoh refused. Because the slaves were not set free, 10 plagues were placed on Egypt. What were these 10 plagues? I know this one. Um, water into blood, frogs, gnats, flies, death of all the cows, warts and boils, uh, locusts, darkness for three days, and the death of all the Egyptian firstborns. Um, sad, but, but yes, that is correct. Don't get stuck in the dark like the Egyptians with the use of this ultra bright headlamp. This LED light is adjustable and comes with two brightness settings. Question six for 600 points. After Pharaoh lost his firstborn son, he allowed the Israelites to be free to follow Moses to the promised land. But the Pharaoh sent the Egyptian army after them. How did Moses prevent the Egyptians from catching them? I know this one too. Moses raised his staff and parted the Red Sea, creating a path for the Israelites to cross. Then, quickly put the water back, closing the path before the Egyptians could get there. Correct again, Simon. Moses could control the Red Sea, but you can control your very own Jacuzzi Spa, equipped with 50 different light settings and 100 massaging jets staple for any backyard Bible study. All right, let's do a point recap. Simon is in the lead with 1,300 points and so far behind. Josh and William tied with 400 points. And that means it's time for our final question worth a whopping 2,000 points. Here to ask the final question. I was buried beneath my shame 
who could carry that kind of weight it was my turn till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tune till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now your mercy has saved my soul And your freedom is all that I know the old man knew Jesus when I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day I needed rescue My sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory My needed shelter I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Because when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day Good morning and welcome once again from Territorial Headquarters in Toronto on this first summer Sunday of July. We welcome you and thank you for choosing to join with us again this morning as we come together and worship. We're pleased to have leading us this morning, Lieutenant Colonels Fred and Wendy Waters. Allow me to share a call to worship for us this morning from 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Praise be to you, O Lord. God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks, and we praise your glorious name. Shall we pray? Father God, you are God of all gods. You are the one that we worship, the only true and proper object of our religious worship. And so, Father, we come today once again to worship you and to adore you, to declare that you are indeed God who is sovereign. Father, we pray that you will be blessed by the offering that we bring to you today in praise and adoration, and that you will speak to us individually wherever we are, 
that you will bring your message to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Follow along with me in scripture, if you will, Psalm 121. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon at night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, now and forever. Amen.
Good morning. It's a delight to share with you today, or whenever, wherever you are viewing this broadcast. Streaming services are doing a booming business. Maybe you've watched a few movies lately. Maybe you've seen the Pixar movie, A Bug's Life. Produced in 1998, it tells the story from the perspective of the anthill. The queen ant and her daughter, Princess Anna, lead an ant colony, which works most of the summer to produce an offering of food for the grasshoppers. The grasshoppers arrive the same time each year to eat the food gathered for them. Now the offering is really given through extortion, as the grasshoppers have threatened them. Emerge the hero, Flick, a regular ant with a knack for invention. He heads out of the ant colony to go and find warrior bugs to rescue the colony. Well, he does discover a group of circus performers who he thinks are tough bugs to scare off those grasshoppers. I won't give away all the details, but at the end of the movie, which of course ends with Flick being the hero and the ant colony being rescued, the camera pans away from the scene to show us all that this has happened in a very tiny area at the bottom of a single tree sitting in a vast panoramic site. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not comparing us to ants. But I am suggesting that our viewing of a single event, a small part of our overall experience, cannot be seen as a good understanding of the truth. Did you know the longest discourse recorded of God's voice is found in the book of Job? Job, from the land of Uz, is described as a blameless, upright man who fears God. Job 1 and 3 records, he was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Now Satan challenges of God. Of course he believes in you. But take away all his prosperity, and he will curse you. So God allows much suffering to come to Job. That's the theme of the first 37 chapters and the narrative of his wife and friends to his state. Eventually, Job raises his complaint to God, and Job 38:41 records God's response with some pointed questions. Job, where were you when I laid the foundations, set its dimensions, put its footings in place, laid the cornerstone of the earth? Have you ever given orders to the morning, given dawn its place? Have you ever seen the storehouse of snow and hail? Do you send lightning bolts on their way? The point of God's questioning is, of course, to answer the accusation that the suffering of Job is attributed to God, that he's somehow absent from our presence, either unaware or uncaring about our human struggle. Now, not to equate the great biblical story of Job with a Pixar film, here's my point. To understand the whole story based on a very small setting in a very limited time is to misunderstand the real nature and purpose of God. Our finite, enormously limited view is that of mortal man. Let me give you a different scriptural example. If you read Matthew 27, Mark 15, or Luke 23, or John 19, all of which describe the crucifixion of Christ and do so in isolation, you'd come to this conclusion. Evil has won over good. Satan has defeated God. Darkness has now covered light, and eternity is lost to a moment in time. But we know that this is not the whole story. Read on in any of the Gospels, and you discover that the suffering and death of Jesus is not the whole story. And in fact, the purpose of God and the sacrifice of Jesus, his son, has actually accomplished a more eternal win. Paul writes, O oh, death, where is your sting? Viewed from heaven's perspective, it is the complete opposite. Good has won over evil. God has defeated Satan's attack. Light shines through the darkness. Eternity lives on in the hearts of all who love God. So in the midst of difficult days, isolated lives, loss, perhaps great suffering has taken place. But this is not the end of the story, and God is not absent nor uncaring. He is at work and is very present in our time of need. He is very much bringing learning to our experience, giving us opportunity to grow in faith and trust, in developing spiritual aptitude, allowing us to live a greater life by serving others. Here's an assuring word from the pen of Paul. Romans 8:31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. May God bless you, and may he bring understanding of his will and his ways in your life. Let's pray together. We thank you that our 
days, Lord, are not in isolation, that you are always present. Thank you that your Spirit's promise is that you will not only walk with us, but be go before us. You are our comfort, you are our strength, you are our peace, you are our eternal reward. And so in these days, I pray for those who are watching and listening and for those who surround them, that you will be all these things to them. Help us to see your hand at work. Give us opportunity to grow in faith and trust and service to others. And may we in this day have great encouragement from knowing that your hand is indeed upon us and in our lives. Bless those who are important to us, who come to mind, who are our loved ones. And may your hand be upon the Salvation Army, not only in Canada and Bermuda, but around the world. Be with the church, be in the church. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, proclaiming peace, announcing news of happiness, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. Shout for your King, your King. See eye to eye, the Lord restoring Zion. Your God reigns, your God reigns. of Jerusalem break forth with joy we are redeemed redeemed the Lord has saved and comforted his people your God reigns your God reigns our God reigns is Lord, is Lord. Before the nations he has bared his holy arm. Your God reigns, your God reigns. 